What's up guys, it's Blitzkin here and welcome to a new series, The Art of the Sandbox, where we're going to be breaking down some of the games that I feel implement their sandboxes in a way that's spectacularly executed. So, with that being said, welcome to episode 1, and today we're going to be going over Halo Combat Evolved. Halo is a great example of how to create a sandbox experience that is endlessly fun. Here we are, over 20 years later now, and I can still play this game and enjoy it as much, if not more, than I did when I was a kid. So let's break down the basics. The principles that Halo was built off of in terms of its gameplay loop was the 30 seconds of fun philosophy, in which you are supposed to enter a combat engagement and end it in 30 seconds. And within those 30 seconds, you're supposed to use visual, audio, and other cues to assess how you should go about carrying out this combat encounter, what tools you should use, whether you should be aggressive or defensive. In that 30 seconds is where you make all of these decisions that influence the experience that you're going to be having. Let's start breaking down some of the elements that are involved in these decisions that you make within these 30 seconds. Now, Halo has been set with a very basic foundation in terms of its guns. You have kinetic weapons and you have plasma weapons. Kinetic weapons do damage against an enemy's health. Same goes for you, it also damages your health. Plasma weapons will damage an enemy's shield. Now, while plasma can also be used to damage health and kinetic can also be used to damage shields, both of them work better when they're being used within the context they were designed for. Now, not all enemies have shields and not all enemies respond well to a certain type of weapon. So as the player, it's your job to get familiar with these weapons and this basics of plasma and kinetic and know when to use which or when to pair them together to achieve your goals. Accompanying this idea of plasma and kinetic weapons, there are different power-ups throughout the world. You have health pickups, which replenish the health damage that we were talking about before. Your shields will recharge automatically. But that being said, you don't have to just go with normal shields. You can find these overshields throughout the map, which can be useful to tank through some difficult enemy encounters, or maybe run past guys that you don't have enough ammo to fight against. It's a nice buff to your overall shields, which protects your health. You must keep in mind, though, that certain plasma weapons are capable of destroying all of your shields. This includes when you have an overshield. So even though this is still a buff, it's not an easy get out of jail free card if it's used improperly. The last power up would be active camouflage. Active camouflage gives you about around 30 seconds, maybe a little bit more to go almost completely invisible and be able to sneak past your enemies. This is useful for skipping through certain fights, getting the drop on certain tougher enemies, or just positioning yourself in a better position to start a firefight rather than letting the enemy get the drop on you. Now, beyond these weapons and power-ups, you also have vehicles, vehicles that are deeply intertwined with environmental interaction. Some vehicles handle better on rocky, dirt-ridden terrain, and other vehicles excel better on snowy or ice-layered terrain. And the last part that we should go over with the basics would probably be the actual level layout. The level layout has a lot to do with how these encounters play out. An encounter that takes place on an open field will require different weapons and strategies than an encounter that takes place in an enclosed box-shaped room. One of the things that makes Halo so adept at teaching its sandbox and all of its intricacies to its players is its level designs and map layouts and pacing in the campaign. So let's start with the first mission, Pillar of Autumn. Here, you as the Master Chief need to escape the ship that you're on while fighting off alien covenant borders as they try to take you and the entire ship down. Now, this mission is literally just a series of hallways. There's nothing too intricate in terms of spacing here. The main focus of this mission in terms of teaching you its sandbox is showing you the basics of kinetic and plasma weapons. Now, there are only two plasma weapons and two kinetic weapons present on this map. In terms of kinetic weapons, you have the M60 pistol. Now, this is terribly balanced as a pistol. 
However, if you start to see it as more of a DMR and battle rifle, which isn't too far from the truth because the way this pistol ended up being balanced set the standard for precision weapons moving forward. So if you start seeing it as a precursor to the DMR or battle rifle, suddenly this pistol doesn't seem like such a bad balanced weapon. So the M6D is a precision weapon. If you shoot an unshielded enemy with just a kinetic weapon headshot, it'll take them down instantly. You can fire precision single shots and semi-automatic fire or you can hold down the trigger to fire in a full auto mode. Now the full auto mode isn't too quick, but it's still a high enough rate of fire to help mitigate large crowds of enemies if you're surrounded by weaker opponents. So if you're not catching on quite yet, this weapon kind of acts as a jack of all trades. It's perfect for short range situations, and it's also really good for mid range and even in some scenarios, long range situations, but more on that later. The other kinetic weapon is the MA-5B Assault Rifle. Now, in the same way the M60 set the standard for DMRs and battle rifles moving forward in the Halo franchise, the MA-5B kind of set the standard for what would later become the high-capacity, low-damage SMG of Halo 2 and 3. And even in 5, they featured the SMG. The reason why I call this thing a precursor to the SMG is because it has a crazy large magazine capacity, it does pitiful damage, however, it has an extremely high fire rate. This thing is balanced as how most games would balance something like the P90. It doesn't do a lot of damage, but because you have so much ammunition, it doesn't really matter. You use this gun to spray across a short-ranged area or just slowly drain down an opponent's health. So, both of these weapons are curiously enough balanced like completely other weapon classes, however, these are the human equivalents of the pistol and assault rifle. This brings us over to our plasma weapons. The first would be the plasma pistol. The plasma pistol is what I would refer to as the game's true pistol. Whereas the M6D is balanced more like a DMR or battle rifle, this is balanced like a true pistol in the sense it has low damage, but a decent rate of fire, and you can find it pretty much everywhere, meaning that it's always going to reliably have ammo, even in situations where other guns might be running dry. Now, you have the standard firing mode of this that's useful for dealing with low-level enemies and keeping multiple opponents when it comes to crowd control stunned or at bay, and it's also really good for chipping down shields. However, there's an alternate firing mode in which you can hold down the trigger and release a bolt of plasma that will instantly take down an enemy's shields. So to a new player, this weapon might seem pretty useless and difficult to use, but to an experienced Halo veteran, this weapon is crucial for success, especially on higher difficulties, because of the capabilities you get with that charged bolt of plasma. The other plasma weapon on this map would be the plasma rifle. Now, this essentially only has one firing mode, which is just a full auto unleashing of plasma bolts. Similar to how the plasma pistol can have a high rate of fire if you feather the trigger, this one here you can just hold it down and it has a little bit more damage, so it's really adept at taking down shields. But again, it goes a little bit beyond that. Like I said before, some plasma weapons can also be used to do a decent amount of kinetic damage, and this plasma rifle here is a great example of that. Not only will it strip your enemy's shields, but it'll stun lock them in place, meaning while this won't do as much kinetic damage as fast as, say, the M60 pistol, it'll stun lock an enemy so they have no choice but to take the bolts that you're firing at them, making this an exceptional weapon throughout the campaign. If the MA5B is more so balanced like a high capacity, low damage SMG, the plasma rifle is more so balanced for what we expect out of a video game assault rifle. Now the way they balance the plasma rifle and make sure you can't just spam this thing and take out everything in a room is by having it overheat if you hold that trigger for too long. This brings us to the grenades. Now there's a human grenade and there is a covenant grenade. The human frag grenade is best used for crowd control or just eliminating enemies from a certain area. So if you need to take a advantageous point or clear a bunker, this is the weapon to throw, as it just does a lot of splash damage. The plasma grenade is a little bit more complicated. 
While you could totally just throw it towards a bunch of enemies and use it for its splash damage, it sticks. Specifically, it sticks to enemies. So, if you're in a room and you notice there's an enemy standing right in the middle of all of his friends, you can throw the plasma grenade at him, it'll stick to him, he'll panic, he'll run, and he might do untold levels of damage to all of the guys around him. Or if you're just going up against a single difficult enemy and you don't have the ammo, shields, or health to really go in a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight with him, this can be a very good get out of jail free card if you can manage to stick it onto the enemy and get back into cover in time. So two very different weapons, both requiring very unique strategies. But what makes Halo Sandbox so unique isn't just that there's weapons that are balanced brilliantly, it's that the enemies fall into line with these weapons so brilliantly as well. On this first mission, the enemy variety is as simple as the weapon variety. You get Grunts, which are the Covenant's backbone. These are very weak enemies that try to assault you in large numbers. In this mission, they primarily and pretty much exclusively only use the Plasma Pistol. In their hands, the Plasma Pistol is mostly used in that first mode of fire, where they just launch a bunch of Plasma Bolts at you and shit down your shields. Again, they're not much of a problem, but if you're not keeping aware of where they all are, or if they get the drop on you, they can pose a decent threat. Also, they are capable of throwing plasma grenades not just at you, or around you, but at your allies. So if you're taking cover behind a wall and they stick one of your allies with a plasma grenade, that ally can run into you and take you down. So these enemies are weak, but they're still dangerous if you underestimate them. The other enemies that are on this map are the blue and red elites. Now the blue elite miners are not going to be very aggressive and don't have very strong shielding. So if you're coming at them with a plasma rifle, you can chew down an elite miner quite simply. They're still capable of throwing grenades like the grunts, and they can take a little bit more damage than an individual grunt. And they use the plasma rifle. So while they're not much of a boost from the danger that a grunt poses, they are still competent enemies that you need to pay a little bit more attention to. But the ones that are the real danger to you on this mission are the Red Elite Majors. The Elite Majors have stronger shields and are much more aggressive and will charge you down. So if you don't understand how to use the plasma weapons to take out their shields before hitting them with kinetic damage, these guys can easily overtake you. As you go throughout the Pillar of Autumn, you'll find a whole bunch of situations in which you should use your grenades, in which kinetic weapons are better, in which plasma weapons are better. And there's just a bunch of series of hallways that just teach you how to deal with elites. Are you going to use a charged plasma shot, take out its shields, and then headshot it with a pistol? Or are you going to empty out its shields with a plasma rifle and then hit it really hard to knock it down? Are you going to throw a frag grenade into a bunch of grunts and then take on the elites alone? Or are you going to throw a plasma grenade onto an elite, have him panic and run into the grunts? It's the perfect playground to teach you the basics of Halo. Hell, the level even teaches you how to use health pickups as well as overshields. Health pickups are pretty straightforward. After your shield depletes, enemy damage that's done to you will damage your health and health does not regenerate. So while your shields will charge back up, if you want to heal up, you will have to find one of these health items. You can also find overshields on this map, which teach you that there are certain buffs that you can find throughout the world of Halo to allow you to play a little bit more aggressively. After the first mission is when Halo really opens up and shows you the wide expanses that you can expect in your future combat encounters. Now the next mission, aptly titled Halo, is where you spawn on the ring, and suddenly a whole new bunch of elements are introduced in terms of the game's sandbox. You get a new enemy that shows up in the form of the Jackal. In one of your first combat encounters, you'll notice that the Jackals act similarly to Grunts, however the shield that's in front of them makes it so that you can't just run straight at them and mow through them. You need to move to the sides, you need to try to find openings, using either your precision pistol to shoot the weak spots in the shield, or the assault rifle to catch the jackal when it's rolling, or you can use plasma weapons to take out that shield entirely. Now while jackals will use the plasma pistol like the grunts do in the sense that they will fire it at a high rate of fire to mow down your shields, 
If you're at longer ranges, the jackals will use the charge shot, making the jackals act almost like a sniper type enemy, in the sense that you might be occupied with all of these other opponents. However, unlike almost every other enemy you fight in this game, the jackal might be around 50 meters or more away from you, charging up its pistol and firing that shot. So you might be busy dealing with another red elite. However, all of a sudden your shields are down and that elite has the upper hand and you need to go onto the defensive. So keeping jackals in mind in terms of where they're positioned, what exactly they're doing, how many of them are there? Do you have grenades to just take them out easily? What strategy would go best with them? is very important in these combat encounters. Grunts, you can be a little bit mindful of. Elites demand your attention when they're up close, but a jackal is always a threat, even if they're not directly in the fight with you. And honestly, this is the best that Halo sniper type enemies have ever been balanced. Future iterations of the series try to make them act more like human snipers, and that doesn't really work out for Halo. But here, the looming alien threat that can take out your shields from far away, completely changing the combat dynamic while not taking you out of it, is perfectly balanced. Aside from the inclusion of the Jackal, some new weapons are also featured on this map. You get the Needler, which acts as the game's SMG. Now, unlike the Assault Rifle, it's not the type of SMG where you can just spray across a wide variety of enemies. It's an SMG that's very context specific. If you have a Needler and you don't know how to use it, you are going to get destroyed with it. The Needler is meant to be used to take down singular opponents. You get up close to them, you squeeze the trigger, and it'll release these pink needles that lock onto them, and once you get enough needles into a single enemy, it'll blow them up, instantly killing them. This applies for almost every enemy in the game, so even the harder elites, with shields, will have these needles go in and blow them up, completely negating their shields and their health, making the needler act as a super weapon if you use it in that very niche scenario. At the same time, if your enemies have a decent amount of range from you, or if there's too many enemies fighting you at once, the needler isn't going to be your best choice. However, in a pinch, it can be an excellent tool to make it through the combat encounter. Your enemies will also be using this the same way. And while it won't be too much of a threat to you if you have your shields up, if your shields are down and you see those pink needles coming towards you, you need to evade or get into cover, because these things can track you for a decent ways. And if you get hit by enough needles while your shields are down, your death is almost certain. Another human weapon is introduced on this map too. Large open expanses demand a precision weapon, and now while you can use your M60 in more of that DMR and battle rifle role, it's still outclassed in terms of long, long range combat by the sniper rifle. The sniper rifle allows you to take full control of the situations that you're going to be finding yourself in, which is very important now because now you have enemies like the jackals that can also fire at you from really long ranges. So using the sniper helps put that control back into your hands. As long as you're patient, get good positioning, and aren't too trigger happy to run through all of its ammo. Just like with the Pillar of Autumn, there are situations on this map that really serve as teaching playgrounds for you with these new weapons. The wide open expanses are the perfect place to experiment with the sniper. And the small enclosed underground areas you'll find yourself fighting in are the perfect areas to use the Needler. But there's a very important element that is introduced here that wasn't present in the last mission, and that is vehicles. There are two vehicles of importance introduced here. One being the human Warthog, which has become the bread and butter of Halo exploration and combat. It's a truck that comes with a driver's seat, a passenger seat, and a mounted turret in the back for someone else to use. This allows you to utilize your marine companions in combat, as normally they tend not to be very effective. However, you get a marine in the turret of your Warthog, which does not overheat and does not run out of ammo, and essentially acts like a MA-5B assault rifle on steroids, and you have a competent ally. 
You can also utilize this turret and use the Warthog to drive around, find a good position, get out, and then use the turret. And as long as you're mindful to keep a decent amount of distance between you and the enemy, this is a strategy that works quite nicely on the missions where the Warthog is available. The other vehicle that you can't really drive but will be coming at you is the Covenant Flying Banshee. This adds an element of verticality to the combat as not only do you have to look to your front, right, left, and behind you, you also need to keep in mind of what's above you. Now the way the developers kept this balanced is by having the Banshee make a very loud noise whenever it's flying around you. So you get that auditory cue that something above is going to start shooting at you. Otherwise, it would just be unfair if these things could just ambush you from above. This would be a good time to mention how one of the things that makes Halo Sandbox so effective is the fact that you have all of these visual cues, good example of that would be the different colored elites, but you also have all these auditory cues. Grunts will always make certain noises when they throw grenades, when they flee. Elites will make a very specific noise when they charge at you, or when their shields are down. So you're constantly receiving all of this information through your eyes and your ears. So you are constantly aware of what's happening on the battlefield and you can make those decisions within that 30 seconds of fun in terms of how to proceed. The next mission, Truth and Reconciliation, removes the M60 from your inventory and gives you instead the sniper rifle with more ammo than you're ever going to get in any other mission in the campaign. It does this because it really wants to show you another element that the sniper rifle has. The beginning of the mission that takes place on this nighttime desert plateau allows you to turn on the night vision feature of the sniper rifle and fire at enemies while they're unaware of your presence, teaching you that if the enemies can't really see you or where you're firing from, it won't instigate a combat scenario. So there's an element of stealth in Halo, and you can use that either by getting the drop on enemies from behind or by using weapons like the sniper rifle from really far away where the AI isn't really capable of registering that you're around and that they should fight you. Building on the stealth motif of this mission, it also introduces active camo pickups that you can pick up in the game. You can pick these up and use them in this nighttime environment while your troops are distracting Covenant soldiers to get to a better sniping position or to take out the elites from behind and put the odds in your favor. The mission also introduces shade turrets, which are really large, slow firing, but high damage plasma bolts that are fired at you from a stationary turret that's usually manned by grunts, but can also be manned by elites. One of the strategies to take these things down is use your sniper while they're unaware, or use your sniper to hit them from far away where they can still hit you. In fact, the shade turrets are kind of the AI's counter to your sniper rifle, as normal AI weapons aren't really going to engage you at the distances that you might be using the sniper, but the shade turrets can reach across the map and fire at you. However, this is balanced because the bolts are slow and there's enough of an auditory and visual cue for you to see that one of these things are firing at you and you can act accordingly. But yeah, you can use your sniper to take this down, you can spray at the enemy with an assault rifle, slowly chipping down their health, you can throw a grenade to disable this thing. There's a lot of different ways to handle them. This mission is probably most important for introducing a lot of new enemies to you that again, build on that hardcore stealth and hardcore combat element of Halo Combat Evolved. In terms of the hardcore combat elements, you get the Hunters, which serves as walking tanks that you need to fight. They use a fuel rod cannon, which acts as a covenant equivalent of a rocket launcher and will send a very large, slow bolt of plasma that has the potential to kill you in two to three shots. If you try to get too close to these things, they can whack you with these giant shields that they carry. Shooting at them from the front isn't really recommended as their shields block almost all damage. So you can either use the assault rifle to just pelt damage into them, or you can make your way to the back of the hunter and use precision weapons like the sniper or the M60 to one-shot them at a very sore spot in the back that's hard to get to, but once you get there, you can take them down with ease. That being said, when you're tangoing with two hunters, if you don't know what you're doing in terms of mobility and positioning, you might be in for a hard time if you try this tactic. 
The game also introduces new variants of elites. Gold elites and stealth elites. Now the gold elites come in two forms, with a plasma rifle or with an energy sword. The Plasma Rifle Gold Elite will act like a harder, a much harder version of the Red Elite Major, throwing grenades, being very aggressive, having extremely strong shields, and being able to tear down your shields and health very quickly. The best way to deal with these guys is either through using the tried and true plasma grenade method, using the plasma rifle to melt down their shields and then hitting them with a precision headshot, or using something like the Needler in a very enclosed environment and having that like drop on them to spray out all the needles that you can and blowing them up instantly. While there are ways to get around these guys, none of them are going to be easy and inexperienced players are going to have a rough time dealing with these guys. The ones with the swords are perhaps even more dangerous because they run at you much faster than you can move and can instantly kill you if they reach you. They also tend to throw a lot more grenades. So dealing with either one of these variants of the Elite, the Sword or the Plasma Rifle variant, is going to be an extreme challenge for the player and demand knowledge of everything that you've learned over the past couple missions. The Camo Elites act a little bit differently. They are much weaker than the Elite Miner. Their shields are pretty much nothing and you can kill them with almost any weapon quite easily if you can catch them. These elites are completely silent, so the plasma rifle variants are gonna be unseen until they start shooting at you, meaning they can position themselves however they want and get the drop on you quite easily. So listening for those auditory cues and looking very closely at the screen for that distortion in the air that shows their camo is going to be important with dealing with these guys. This is where something like the assault rifle really comes in handy. There's another variant of camo elites that comes with a sword. Now with these guys here, you can see the sword because honestly, if there was a completely invisible elite with a sword that could kill you instantly, that, that would be an issue in terms of the balancing. So you can't see them, but you can see the glowing sword. However, these guys will be smart and only spawn or they will hide until you come around certain corners and then they'll stab you. And again, they move much faster than most enemies. So while you get that warning with those audio cues and the sword, seeing one of these guys just appear or seeing a floating sword appear in the corner of your screen immediately or should immediately send you into an alert to take these guys down. Again, they don't have a lot of health or shields, but if they get the drop on you, it's almost an instant guarantee of death. This mission is remembered fondly by many Halo players because it's so interesting because it throws you with so many new enemies and items all at once. But at the same time, it's also one of the more challenging Halo 1 missions as you don't have that jack of all trades M6D to rely on in really tense scenarios. You're either using weapons that are really good for long range or really good for short range, with the exception of course being the plasma rifle where if you know how to use it, you'll get through this just fine. The next mission, Silent Cartographer, takes place, like the game's second mission, on a more open environment, this time on an island that you can explore freely. Not much new stuff is introduced here. You just have more hunter encounters, you have wide open spaces to fight across, you have to manage your jackals and your camo elites. There's a lot of situations where you can use the overshield for mobility in the sense that you can get an overshield and jump off a cliff in order to tank the fall damage in order to get to a certain area faster. So it's not necessarily new things are being introduced, it's just still testing your knowledge on all the things that have been brought up from before. However, there's one new weapon that gets introduced here, and that would be the rocket launcher. Now, the Spanker rocket launcher fires slow projectiles that do crazy amounts of splash damage. It's essentially, if the sniper and the frag grenade had a baby, this is what you get. Now the rocket launcher is obviously useful for taking down harder enemies like hunters or higher level elites, or for taking out crowds of enemies that might be coming at you. Just be careful when you're using this, however, because when you're in the confined spaces of the underground forerunner passageways of this mission, it can become a double-edged sword and you might kill yourself if using it too close when other enemies are coming at you. Still, this is a great weapon to use if you know you're about to head into a very tense and difficult scenario. 
The next mission, Assault on the Control Room, is one of my favorite missions in the game. Strictly because it focuses less on introducing new sandbox elements and instead creates arena after arena for you to test out all of the tools you've been using up until this point. That being said, there are still some sandbox elements introduced here. Two vehicles specifically, that being the Ghost and the Scorpion. The Ghost acts much in the same way as the Covenant Banshee, except unlike the Banshee, it's a land vehicle. However, it still hovers. So whereas your Warthog might have a hard time handling the snow and ice you'll be driving across, the Ghost will be able to glide over every kind of terrain quite easily. It also comes with turrets mounted on it that fire out like a plasma rifle on steroids, so it's a spectacular tool for mobility and combat. The Scorpion tank is also introduced on this mission here. Now, if I could describe how you fight with this thing, it's like a vehicle sniper rocket launcher hybrid in the sense that you have this very powerful cannon that's best used from distances away to take out tanks, turrets, enemies, banshees, whatever you come across. It also comes with another turret like the Warthog that you can fire while you're using the tank. However, this thing is extremely inaccurate and more so to use just to keep enemies at bay while your main gun reloads. Another enemy type slash vehicle is introduced on this map here, the Wraith. These things are the covenant equivalent of the tank. Now, because it would be extremely frustrating and boring to have a scorpion laser you from across the map in this mission here, the Covenant Wraith instead acts as a motor in the sense that it fires out a slow projectile up into the sky that comes crashing down with explosive devastation. Again, there's a very unique sound. You can see this large plasma bolt arc through the air and travel down towards you so you're still receiving all of that information, but it'll still fire enough of these volleys at you where it's a challenge to dodge. It really presses you to stay mobile and either use vehicles like the Ghost or the Scorpion or use higher tier weapons like the rocket launcher that you experimented with in the last mission. But back onto the topic of the arenas that this mission presents you with, here you get extensive fields where you can play around with the sniper, the rocket launcher, the M6D, the ghosts, and all these new vehicles that you can use. Uh, there's situations where you're indoors in forerunner structures where guns like the needler, the plasma rifle, and the plasma pistol really come into play. Your grenades, just every strategy you've been using, their power-ups like the active camo that can be used to skip certain sections. There's so much variety in terms of the encounters on this map, and the game really isn't holding back with the early game enemies and weapons that you get presented with. Of course, the game's about to open up a hell of a lot more with the reveal on this next mission, but for the sake of talking about Assault on the Control Room, it's just a spectacular example of what Halo can do when it really frees up your options and focuses on creating its environments around combat encounters that just invite you to experiment. Am I just going to snipe enemies from across this field? Am I going to drive a ghost? Am I going to take a scorpion tank and a bunch of marines and just peg all these enemies from far away and then let the marines clean up whatever I don't hit? The options are yours. Before moving on, a little detail about this mission that I don't see nearly enough people bring up is the fact that there's a level skip. Towards the end of the mission, you'll come across this naturally formed rock bridge on a canyon. If you have the sniper rifle, and if you're fast enough, you can take out the elite before he reaches his banshee, as well as all the guards around the banshee. This allows you to use the banshee much earlier. You'd otherwise have to wait till mission 8 to be able to use a banshee, but here in mission 5, if you're fast enough and if you have that sniper rifle, you can take out these enemies, hop into a banshee, and fly to the end of the level, where most of the enemies that you would normally have to fight, that being mostly like hunters that spawn on this tower that you have to climb up. If you take this banshee, they're not gonna be able to spawn and you'll be able to just get to the final encounter and make it through the mission a lot faster. This is a great tool for speedrunners. So there's just so much depth to this mission. And this depth really shows just how masterful Halo 1 Sandbox really is. If Assault on the Control Room 
was Halo's way of allowing you to experiment and really show what you've learned with the game Sandbox. 343 Guilty Spark is where it straps you right back down into a chair and sets you up for the final and most important lesson. Now there are so many videos out there on how this mission is genius in terms of horror, in terms of build up, in terms of a plot twist reveal, but I'm not here really to talk about the artistic merit of the mission, I'm here to talk about what it means for the actual development of the game Sandbox. And this mission is incredibly important in that regard, as whereas you start off fighting very basic enemies, that being grunts and jackals, you eventually have to fight the Flood, and the Flood add an entirely different element to the game's combat. Now, if you'll remember, guns like the Assault Rifle were only really good at either slowly whittling down the health or shields of harder enemies, or managing a bunch of grunts. Within the Flood, there are many different forms, and the Assault Rifle becomes very useful fighting a lot of them. Namely, the infection forms. When you first get introduced to the Flood, you're assaulted by a series of infection forms, which are the small ones that pop at the slightest bit of damage, but focus on overpowering you when you're just completely surrounded in combat. So for example, if I'm just in the room, the starter room where the Flood are introduced, and Flood infection forms are coming at me, they'll pop on my shield, slowly whittling it down. However, with the assault rifle, I can just completely chew through crowd after crowd, giving this weapon more of a cemented place within the game's sandbox. That being said, with these enemies here, it might seem like they're just a little annoyance to take care of, however, they also have a very important place in the sandbox because they act as the anti-jackal. If you remember before, I talked about how you had to keep jackals in mind when you're fighting other enemies, because that charged plasma pistol bolt can take out your shields and then completely change the dynamic of whatever fight you're in, in an instant. Flood infection forms act in the opposite way, whereas with them, you don't need to worry about your shields disappearing, you just need to keep them in mind so that if another enemy takes out your shields, you need to make these guys your priority, because whereas they cannot even touch you when you have shields, the second that they're gone, these things will chew you up in seconds, especially on harder difficulties. So this seemingly venial enemy ends up becoming a major threat given the right context, given the right sandbox combination. Again, adding to why Halo 1 is just so freaking brilliant with its sandbox. You're also introduced to the Flood Combat Form. Now the Flood Combat Form comes in two variants, the weaker human variant and the stronger elite variant. Both of these enemies have extremely strong melee attacks that can take you down in three to four hits. If you don't have shields, there's a potential that they can take you down in one to two hits. Now, these variants here are different from all the Covenant enemies that you've been fighting in this game so far. Because when these guys get introduced, you are no longer the only entity in Halo that's capable of using the entire sandbox. That's capable of combining plasma and kinetic weapons. Flood combat forms can pick up whatever they want or spawn in with both human and covenant weapons. This changes everything. Because before, when a high level elite would come at you, you knew your shields were gonna go fast, but he was still using a plasma rifle. So he'd still need to stop and pause and he still wouldn't chip down your health too quickly. Now, you'll get ganged up on by different flood combat forms one of which will be using a plasma rifle to chip down your shields, and the other will be coming at you with a kinetic assault rifle to immediately chip down your health. So when you're fighting these guys, it's kind of like the antithesis to everything you've learned. You're no longer learning about how, okay, how do I utilize the sandbox in order to come out on top? You need to start thinking, how are they utilizing the sandbox to completely obliterate me? You need to deconstruct their tactics by understanding that they are doing the exact same thing that you have done. You need to think, okay, they're coming at me, I see one with a plasma rifle, and I see a couple with assault rifles. My priority should be 
to take out the one with the plasma rifle. Now I don't need to worry about it chipping down my shields. Now I can tank the hits that are going to be coming from these combat forms with assault rifles. And this is the magic of the Flood, and this is why I disagree with a lot of people that say, oh, they're not fun to fight because all they do is charge at you. No, they are your mirrored opponents. These are the anti-players in Halo. They will use all of the dirty tricks that you've been using to just wipe through the Covenant and have fun with these encounters, like an assault on the control room, going back to that. You knew everything that was going on. You were used to all of these enemies. You've seen them before. You know exactly how to handle them. Now here's an enemy that knows exactly how to handle you. That's the terror of the Flood and their place in the sandbox. And that's what makes them such an interesting enemy to fight. Now the last type of Flood that you're going to be coming across is going to be the Flood Carrier Forms. Now these guys are interesting in the sense that they are walking grenades. You can shoot them when they come up to you, but once they take a given amount of damage, they're going to explode and release a bunch of infection forms. So if you're too close to one of these guys when they pop, you can pretty much die because it's pretty much like standing next to a grenade. If you shoot one of them and they blow up next to another one, they're not gonna blow up immediately. They're gonna fly across the room and wherever they land, they're gonna blow up there. So you can shoot a flood carrier form from a safe distance. He'll blow up and send one of his friends flying towards you. So these really are sentient grenades that you need to watch over in the battlefield because you might be busy with someone else or you might throw a grenade at them and think they're taken care of, then all of a sudden they pop right by you. Then on top of that, even if you have taken all the precautions and you make sure that they haven't popped right by you, now all of a sudden you need to deal with these infection forms that come out from underneath. And as we talked about before, these infection forms, the anti-jackals. By this point that you've been shooting the carrier forms, you're probably fighting some flood combat forms. You're not really thinking about it. Maybe a combat form with a plasma weapon takes down your shields. But it's okay, you don't really see any of them with kinetic weapons, but it's not. Because the carrier forms, infection forms that it's released after exploding, are now going to chew on your ass from behind. The Flood are amazing, and this mission is amazing for introducing them, and I'm so glad that they are a part of Halo. But that's not all that gets introduced in 343 Guilty Spark. Perhaps one of my favorite video game weapons of all time also gets introduced here. The M90 Cause Shotgun. This is a high capacity pump action shotgun that is the complete and perfect ally and companion when fighting against the Flood. Now while the Flood will come at you with the game's entire sandbox, they are overly aggressive because this isn't an elite that wants to, you know, fight you in noble combat. This isn't a grunt that wants to run away and save its life. This is just a hive mind zombie that has one goal, kill you. So when these guys are going to be approaching you, massed together, all huddled up, a shotgun is going to be the perfect weapon. Couple this together with the fact that the M90 cause shotgun is spectacular, even at ranges, for taking out unshielded enemies. And the Flood, for all their strengths, don't come with any shields. So this shotgun, even if they're not right in front of you, most games make it so that you need to wait for an enemy to be directly in front of you for a shotgun to be capable. In Halo, this shotgun here, if you don't prove it in 343 Guilty Spark, you definitely prove it in the next mission where you fight nothing but Flood, the library. This shotgun here will take them down almost from around actually 50 meters away. Like you can engage these things at the same ranges that you would engage with the assault rifle or with the plasma rifle. This is a very competent weapon. Hell, in later missions down the road, you can even take out elites from far away if they don't have their shields up. So the M90 cause is an amazing shotgun and is introduced at the perfect moment because it serves as the edge that you're going to need. Now that these flood, these new introduced enemies are gonna be using all the tactics you know, you need to bring something new to the table. And that thing that's new to the table is the M90 cause shotgun. That being said, this shotgun will also be used against you by the flood. As again, you'll see in the library and the next mission that comes after that being two betrayals. 
But before we go on to two betrayals, we need to talk about the library a little bit. In the same way that the Pillar of Autumn and Halo were the first two missions that introduced you to the Covenant and how they work, the library is a continuation of 343 Guilty Spark and allows you to truly get used to all the ways the Flood are going to be attacking you. This is hailed by many players to be the hardest mission. While I personally don't think it's too difficult, I understand why so many people are, get freaked out by this or dread approaching it. And that's because fighting exclusively the Flood, like I said before, requires so many new strategies. You need to change the way you play, the way you think about your enemies, and the way you approach combat. So the library is like a new kind of testing ground to make sure that you understand the Flood before the game continues to just unleash everything on you, its entire sandbox in you, at the next mission. I will mention that in the library and in the next mission to Betrayals, you do come across an enemy that's hated by all the Halo community, the Rocket Flood. I personally don't mind these guys too much because they tend to spawn in at long hallways and are fairly put in there. There are some instances where they spawn in a little too close to the player that can result in some cheap deaths. But at the same time, I don't think Rocket Flood are nearly as annoying as most people say they are. That being said, if I needed to put down a flaw in Halo Combat Evolve Sandbox, it would be some of those unfair Rocket Flood spawns. An easy way to fix the Rocket Flood would be to switch out the Rocket Launcher for a weapon that only enemies in future missions are going to be using, that being the Fuel Rod Cannon. Now the Fuel Rod Cannon, as you'll see in Mission 8, 9, and 10, is the Covenant equivalent of the Rocket Launcher. It's weaker, it fires slower, it has a much more distinct sound, and it glows bright green like plasma pistol charges, so it's very easy to see. It's essentially a shoulder-mounted hunter gun. The same way that the hunters will fire at you, this gun acts very similarly. At the same time, the splash damage that this thing does is nowhere near as powerful as the rocket launcher. So therefore, giving this weapon over to the Flood would still have that rocket-type Flood enemy but a lot of players would probably find this as being more fair, as you'd have a little bit of that oh shit moment and much more of a warning before you get hit by the projectile that's coming at you. This would be one improvement that I would do to Halo Combat Evolve Sandbox. But with that being said, let's continue on to two betrayals and talk about why I think this is the best mission in the game and perfectly exemplifies the power of Halo's Sandbox. Now from this point on, Halo stops offering new maps for its missions, and instead uses reworked versions of old maps, with new enemies, weapons, and combat encounters. Two Betrayal starts where Assault on the Control Room ended, and introduces a new type of enemy, this being the Forerunner Sentinel. Now the Forerunner Sentinel is probably one of the more unique enemies in the game. They hover above you, they use exclusively sentinel beams that you can't use, it's built into them in this game here. And this sentinel beam can chew through your shields and your health very easily, making them quite the threat if you don't know how to handle them. Luckily, Two Betrayals teaches you the optimal strategy for dealing with them as you spawn in with a plasma pistol. Now you remember how we talked about that importance? of the charged plasma pistol bolt both in your hands and in the hands of the enemy? Well, Sentinels, essentially, they don't really have health. They act as just sentient shield enemies. So as soon as you do enough shield damage to them, that being as soon as you hit them with plasma weapons, they just die. So although the Sentinels do a lot of damage to you, both in your shields and health, as long as you have a plasma pistol or hell, even a plasma rifle, they tend to be glass cannons. Now after showing you sentinels, the game launches you back into the main combat loop against its enemies, the main sandbox of everything you've learned up until this point. And at this point in the game, there is no weapon left for you to unlock. Everything is already at your disposal. There are some variants of enemies later down the road, but for the most part, this is Halo throwing everything that it has to throw at you. 
Every vehicle, every gun, and every enemy shows up here. And there are a variety of rooms, just like Assault on the Control Room, that test your knowledge of how to use these guns in different settings against different enemies. This is essentially just harder Assault on the Control Room, because it's not holding your hand anymore. When you go through these rooms, it's not just going to be assorted grunts and elites. Now you're going to have to fight Flood, grunts, elites, everything. And this is the interesting part of Two Betrayals, and part of the reason why I love it so much. Up until this point, all of the battles that took place in Halo were between your faction and the Covenant. So while there were battles between AI, it would be AI that was set on helping you, that being the Marines. Here. There are no more Marines. In fact, after 343 Guilty Spark, where you fight alongside Marines, after you escape the Forerunner Complex, you no longer see them at any point in the campaign, at least while you're playing. So now when you come across these battles happening in these condensed rooms or in these wide open spaces, it's between two factions that both want to kill you. And this adds an entire new strategy element to the gameplay sandbox. Now you can influence fights. You can let the Flood and the Covenant fight each other and see who wins. You can help one side win because you have weapons that are better suited to fight a given side. So you can make sure the side that's easier for you to take down wins. You can just go right in there and take out both of them. There's so much more strategy that gets thrown in here. So many more options. Because now you know what you're doing with the sandbox. By this point here, you're used to fighting the Flood. Now it's just an ultimate toy box for you to endlessly experiment with. And this whole dynamic of just being caught in the middle of a war zone is something that so many games try to emulate but fail to do. Here, it's not the setting of a war zone happening in the background while your main mission is happening in front of you. It's not set dressing. You are in the middle of a war between the Covenant and the Flood and the Sentinels when they show up. So there are actually three factions here fighting and you're caught in the middle of it all. And when you're able to utilize all of the knowledge you have of the sandbox to come out on top against all three of these armies, there are very few games that feel as gratifying, very few sandboxes that feel as good to master. The ninth mission, Keys, is a retreading of Truth and Reconciliation, where you're mostly fighting either through desert plateaus, now flooded with this weird kind of gunk, and the crashed Covenant spaceship. In this mission, you get more of a condensed version of Two Betrayals that's more so focused on tense hallway encounters, infinite flood spawners, and really pushes you to play aggressively now that you're comfortable. Because if you try to play this quietly, or if you try to hold back and just kill the enemies until they stop coming, it's not going to work out because the flood will continuously come. This mission is here to show you that they are a threat. An interesting feature about the flood that I failed to mention before is that many weapons are viable against them, that being the shotgun, as we talked about before, plasma weapons tend to chew them down, the assault rifle will take one down with enough ammo, the M60, the rocket launcher, but there is one weapon that doesn't work against the flood, and this is completely intentional and genius, the sniper rifle. As you'll notice in certain situations in Keys where you have a sniper rifle and you have this perch position, it's before you get back into the ship. There's this flooded swamp, there's a group of hunters, a bunch of Covenant fighting flood enemies that are coming at them. And there's a sniper rifle perched right there. Now, normally in these kinds of situations, in most games, you pick up the sniper and just kill whoever you want. But, as in case you didn't learn about this in Two Betrayals, the game makes a point of giving you a situation where you have the sniper rifle and these enemies fighting in front of you, just to show you that the sniper does not work on the flood. This one weapon that can pretty much take down every enemy in the game with ease from a safe distance does not work on the Flood. Why is this genius in regards to its sandbox? Because it reinforces the intended play style and nature of fighting the Flood within the sandbox. Because you can't rely on the sniper rifle to take these things out from a range, it forces you to fight them from mid-range to short range. And this makes the encounters a lot more intense and gives a lot more character to the Flood and the Sniper Rifle. 
by giving the Flood a buff of resistance to it that helps differentiate them from everything else, and giving the Sniper a much needed weakness, because this is a very powerful Sniper Rifle. That's an important element about all the weapons within Halo Combat Evolved Sandbox. They are very powerful in comparison to a lot of other games that'll just feature some weaker weapons and some stronger weapons. If you compare Halo Combat Evolved Sandbox to pretty much even all the other games in the Halo series, the weapons are OP as shit. But it's because there are so few weapons, and it's because it's a single purpose sandbox in the sense that everything fulfills a specific purpose and does not overlap, that makes these overpowered weapons still work so brilliantly. And this example that we see on keys is a great moment that showcases even something as overpowered as the sniper that you've been using for stealth, that you've been using to thin out the hordes, that you've been using for battlefield control. There comes a point where there's an enemy, there's a sandbox element where you can't just rely on this, reinforcing the idea that throughout Halo 1, there are no dominant strategies. Even with the M60 pistol, that is seen as a jack of all trades and everyone says, oh yeah, it's the best gun in the game. You know what? It is it's still not going to work against every enemy. You still can't use the M60 to take down a Wraith. You still can't use the M60 as effectively to take down certain weapons as if you use something else. It's not gonna shoot as far as a sniper and it's not gonna take down shields as good as a plasma rifle or pistol. So all of these weapons have character. All of these weapons have purpose. And that purpose is built upon by these interactions with the enemies. Beyond this point in the game, the only new elements that get introduced are the Black Elites and the Spec Ops Grunts that accompany them that serve as the strongest versions of their respective enemy types that are, yeah, a very decent challenge. But again, if you've learned the sandbox, if you know to use the plasma rifle and plasma pistol, if you know how to use the sniper, if you know how to manage your grenades, if you know to avoid the fuel rod cannons that tend to blow up after you kill a grunt, if you're smart enough to see the visual cues of it smoking and get away from it, if you're smart enough to use this to your advantage and take out one of the fuel rod grunts and then throw a grenade by its body to create a huge chain explosion to take out all the black elites and the spec ops grunts, you can still get by this, but for players that have not really come to grips or still need to learn certain weapons, these guys are like your final testing ground to make sure that you've mastered this sandbox. Besides them, on the final mission, the Maw, you come across some invisible flood enemies that show up in an armory, but they're not really too important to the overall sandbox, it's more just giving you a scare in a moment where you feel like you're safe restocking your weapons. So this brings us to the conclusion. The art of the sandbox, that's what I'm calling this series. And I'm calling it that because it really is an art when you're putting your game together and choosing all of these elements of interaction the obstacles that the player is going to come across, the tools they're going to use to overcome those obstacles are essential to the experience. And there's so many games out there that do this poorly or just subpar. There's so many games out there where it's not fun to play after a while because the enemies are just the same repetitive, boring things. It's not fun to play after a while because the guns all feel the same. Halo 1 and its means of creating its sandbox truly is art. Everything plays into one another so perfectly. There are counters and balances. Is it perfect? No, the rocket floods could be improved, like I mentioned before. And the M60 pistol should have either, should have been a battle rifle, let's be honest here. And that's why in future games, they change that because this thing acts like a battle rifle or a DMR respectively. But the way that these guns interact with the enemies that they come across, the way that this game is layered between its levels to teach you about these mechanics, to teach you about these strategies, to get you comfortable, then pull the rug out from underneath you and throw in the flood and have you have to learn new strategies to build on top of it. Make it so that when you come back to this game, long after you've beat it, it's still fun because there's so much variation. You never 
You might know how certain situations are gonna turn out, but there's always variables within these 30 seconds of fun that can shift the combat from your favor to the enemy's favor in a second. And figuring out how to get the odds back in your favor is the fun of Halo 1. And this would not be possible without the brilliant enemy design, vehicle design, weapon design, and power-up design in the game. If the assault rifle could just mow down everyone, it wouldn't be a fun game. But because I know I can use this assault rifle to mow down these grunts and I can pick up one of their needlers to corner the golden elite and take him down before he manages to get to me, but then I'll need to quickly switch over to his plasma rifle as flood come in and I'll need something a little bit stronger to chew them down than the assault rifle. And then after I take them down, I'll grab the shotgun so that when I go into the next room and I have to deal with more flood, I can just funnel them all into a hallway before going into an open field where I'm gonna pick up a sniper and then everything's gonna change from that point there i'm going to be taking out turrets maybe i'll hop into a banshee all of a sudden i'm in aerial combat it's just flowing and constantly evolving halo is art because the combat really is evolved i hope you guys enjoyed this video i've been pliskin and i'll see you guys in the next one